and welcome to another review and vlog combo video. I hope you like these videos. Do let me know in the comments what you think about them. Um, it gives me the chance to talk a little bit about the book and also show you a glimpse at some of the questions the author was asked at the event that I went to. The book that I'm going to be talking about today is of course There's Something About Sweetie by Sandia Menon. This one came out on the 14th of May and I was lucky enough not only to be able to rush out and buy it in the morning of the 14th of May but also to be able to go to Sandia's effective Denver launch party at Tattered Cover here in Denver. Um, this book was wonderful. As soon as I bought it in the morning I was lucky that I had time um, on that Tuesday morning to sit and read for a little bit. So I read over breakfast and I read over lunch. I read while I was waiting for the event. Um, and then I finished it off over the next couple of days. So my copy is a signed copy. So I'm trying to show you here. Um, and I will have the vlog footage from the event after this. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the book and then skip to the vlog footage. I'll put a timestamp in the description box below if you only want to hear Sandia being interviewed by Lisa Brown Roberts, who is another awesome Colorado author. Um, so there's something about Sweetie. Uh, let me read you what it's all about. Ashish Patel didn't know love could be so sucky. After he's dumped by his ex-girlfriend, his mojo goes AWOL. So we met Ashish in When Dimple Met Rishi because Ashish is Rishi's brother. Um, even worse, his parents are annoyingly smugly confident he can find a much better match. So in a moment of weakness, Ash challenges them to set him up. The Patels insist that Ashish date an Indian American girl under, con under contract. Per subclause 1A, he'll be taking his date on fun excursions like visiting the Hindu temple and his eccentric Gita auntie. Kill him now. How is he ever going to work? So that is one of the things that I really loved about the book is the dates that Ashish's parents arrange for him to go on. I love the fact that they go to the temple. I love the fact that they visit this eccentric auntie. That part of the book provides some real comedy and the fact that it's out of his control as well. Um, date number four is slightly different. Um, I'm not going to spoil it. All the reviews here are always spoiler free. Um, but I like the fact that Ashish has that relationship with his parents. He has that respect with his parents and, you know, agrees to this contract and agrees to them setting him up with somebody. Um, and yeah, the dates that they go on is probably like one of the things I really enjoyed about the book. I was waiting kind of to see how the next one was going to go. Sweetie is many things. A formidable track athlete who can outrun most people in California. A shower singing champion. Oh, and she's also fat. So Sweetie's traditional parents, this last detail, is the kiss of death. Sweetie loves her parents, but she's so tired of being told she's lacking because she's fat. She decides to kick off the Sassy Sweetie project, where she'll show the world and herself what she's really made of. Ashish and Sweetie both have something to prove, but with each date, they realise there's an unexpected magic growing between them. Can they find their true selves without losing the others? So the fact that Sweetie, there's something about her, um, is uh, a fat character and is also yeah a kick-ass runner and kick-ass singer is amazing i like when we get books with fat characters and the book isn't just about the fact that they're fat like we do need books like that as well however this is about the fact that sweetie is a talented athlete and a talented musician and a daughter and somebody who's going on these amazing dates with ashish i love the fact that it incorporates all of that in there um i love the fact that she is unapologetically fat i love the fact that she owns her fatness and I like for the book that this provides tension with her parents because obviously it is something that we get to explore over the course of the book. Um, the musician part of it, I felt I almost wanted to see like a little bit more of that. There's a sort of battle of the bands type thing that we get to see and we get to see her rehearsing with her friends, but I would have loved to have seen a little bit more of that 
in the book that's probably the the one thing that I would sort of change about the book is that we'd have a little bit more of that but then I would have to cut back on something else which I wouldn't be willing to do so maybe maybe we could have like another novel that has something with the sweetie and her music in um can we just take a moment to just share this love for this joy on the cover? Um, you can see she's been doing a um, holly run um, for the, the holiday. It's all colourful and that does feature in the book and the back cover picture also features in the book, which is very cool. The fact that we have this fat heroine, um, we get an author's note from Sandia at the front here, which is obviously the first thing I read when I opened the book. I love this. She talks about the, um, she talks about Sweetie and how she comes from her own experiences. Um, and she says within the body positivity movement, fat is not a bad word, which word like it tends to be in casual everyday conversations fat is simply the opposite of thin and as such carries no other moral connotations um and she speaks to us as readers who say that you know maybe the word fat makes you cringe um for some readers the word fat has been a weapon um and so she understands if you're not comfortable using it but that's what she's going to use over the course of the novel which i like i like the fact that she acknowledges it and another bit that really really kind of shows how much sweetie owns her fatness um is uh this quote here sorry i was reading <laughs> I'm like rereading the book as I'm talking to you about it um resisting fat phobic messages was one thing but what about the insidious internalized fat phobia that she carried around she was a kick-ass athlete a really good student and extremely creative but she had never let her she had never let she had but she had talent she had never let shine because she had somehow internalized the message that no one really wanted to hear from a fat girl. And that is one of those things that people never talk about in books. That is one of those things that's never said out loud. The fact that we can have, you know, we as fat people can have fat phobia internally for ourselves, stop ourselves doing things, stop ourselves putting, stop, stop putting ourselves out there because oh no i can't do that because i'm fat i can't do that because people will look at me because i'm fat i can't do that because people will judge me because i'm fat um i'm not good enough to do that because i'm fat and like that is something that people just don't talk about in books like we talk about the external judgment and we talk about our own external judgment but we don't talk about enough our internal judgment and that was like my big takeaway from this book we also have a really, really sweet love story, like super, super, super sweet. Like we've got kissing and hand holding and some L word stuff being thrown around. And it's not just our main characters. We have other uh, characters we may have met before in here as well. Um, and I just absolutely love this book. I knew I was going to love it. And the fact that we have this fat heroine just throws in another factor that I can love even more. But you know, good on this author for talking about internalized self fat phobia. Love, love, love that. Okay, I'm going to leave you with the um, vlog footage of the event now. Um, and that will conclude this video. So make sure you are subscribed so that my next video lands in your subscription feed. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed. As I said, let me know in comments if you enjoyed this kind of video. Thank you so much for Tattered Cover for hosting the event and to Sandia for coming and talking to us all. It was wonderful and signing our books. Um, and I hope you enjoy. Bye. Um, what draws you to writing love stories with such humor and heart? And how much do you draw on your own personal experience? Good question. Um, so, I don't know. I think like all writers, how many of you here are writers? Quite a few, okay. So um, I think all writers put themselves into their work, whether they know it or not, at some level we put ourselves into our work because that's how we see the world. Our lens is very unique to us. 
Um, nobody else sees the world exactly like we do and we feel like we have something to say about that which is why we write books and so a lot of my books have parts of me and my life in them although maybe not like a one-to-one -one thing necessarily but yeah and the reason I write what I write is because I feel like when I escape into my office to write the books that I write it really feels like an escape it feels like I can shut off whatever crappy thing has happened that day or that week or that I've seen on the news and just feel happy for like the hour or two that I'm writing and I'm hopeful that people who read my books will have the same experience of just like forgetting and I think that that's happening like I've gotten quite a few emails and letters from people who've been in chemo while they read my book which really makes me feel happy because you know it was just a way to forget the pain and discomfort of chemo and just for a little bit, you know? And so I think that's really powerful about like happy stories is that it lets you escape. Yes. However everyone comes. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Sweetie's a kick butt Indian heroine who also happens to be fat. So what drew you to telling her story? Um, so the, the finished copies actually have a, an author's note in the front that explains this better than I can like on the fly because I had a lot of time to think about that one and put it in there and have my editor look over it and stuff. But the, the main thing is that although I'm not fat now, I have been at various points in my life. And so I've lived life as both a fat woman and a thin woman of color. And nothing surprised me more than how differently people treated me based on what I look like on the outside. And it was crazy. It was like I faced more racism when I was fat. Um, people thought I was poor um, for, you know, I guess because poor, being poor also has the same kind of connotations in society that being fat does, that you're lazy or you're worthless or whatever it is, right, that you don't work hard. And, um, and that's when I kind of conceived of this heroine who would be fat and completely happy in her own skin and fully confident as who she was and not that she doesn't face any uh, discrimination because she does but I wanted to show that she was happy in who she was it was just other people who thought she didn't have a right to be happy in her skin and so they were on this mission to make her feel uncomfortable and sometimes very well-meaning people do that right like people who say i'm concerned for your health mm -hmm. i'm worried about you know whatever right if they always have an excuse of what they're worried about but really it comes down to they don't believe that you can be happy at any size like you have to be thin mm -hmm. in order to be happy or successful mm -hmm. or find love or whatever it is so um i wrote the book because i had experienced that firsthand and then also growing up I wasn't a fat kid growing up, but my sister was. And I, a lot of the conversations that Sweetie has with her mother, who loves her but is afraid for her, um, are really toxic. And those come directly from either my overhearing of my own mom talking to my sister or other people in my family talking to my sister. And honestly, I spoke to my editor before I even wrote the book and we had long conversations and she would tell me some of the things that she heard from her own mom growing up that also made it into the book because I was just like, you know, we need to get to the point in Kidlet where we're addressing conversations and messages that are toxic from parents um, who are not mean parents or bad parents. They're just really misguided parents who think they're doing what's good for their kids and they're not really. And so I wanted to have a character who would refute that on the page and um, I wanted young readers to be able to see that you know so when you were writing the book um did you talk with your sister about it did you have her no i kind of wrote the book in a bubble i just you know i wanted to kind of i didn't talk to my editor I didn't talk to anybody else i wrote it in this bubble of just feeling who the character was and tapping into my own feelings that i had as a fat person rather than going to a third party and then after that, um, I actually did hire since, or my publisher paid for it, but it was my idea to hire sensitivity readers mm -hmm. um, because I think that's so important. Like if you're writing, even though I was fat, I'm not fat now. And I'm sure I have a lot of internalized fat phobia myself that I don't even know exists because right, it's internalized and it's in my way of thinking. And so I um, wanted to have like 
third parties read it and who were trained for that kind of thing and um, they know what they're looking for. And so um, it was an amazing thing. So for any of you writers, if you're considering, I know there's been a lot of conversation about sensitivity readers and people kind of either like the idea or don't, I highly recommend doing it because um, publishers will pay for them a lot of times. And also they're not like, there's this idea that it's something to be afraid of. Or like, that it's censorship. Yeah, or it's censorship, or they might be me and they might not let you say things. And that wasn't my, um, experience at all it was you know two people who really wanted to make the book the best thing it could be and we're just working together to bring it to that uh, level and i didn't feel censored at all mm -hmm. um you do have to like i guess this is true for any editing like you can't let you can't be defensive about it because you know sometimes they will be like but when you said this, this might be a little offensive or did you, you might not have meant it like that, but people could read it like that. And, you know, you have to kind of be like, I can see that. Um, or just like my editor said, if any of this is, is hard to read, maybe take some time to think about it. But I was cool. I was like, no, I get it. I get what she's saying. And she was very, she was very gentle and nothing was overtly <coughs> offensive. It was just like, instead of weight, maybe say size, or instead of size, say weight here, or that kind of thing. And um, it was it was a great experience. I really enjoyed it. It's great. I think the YA community in particular is doing a great, yeah. great job of sensitivity. I think so. Readers and being so conscious of that. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, you know, I, as someone who has been up and down in my way too, and reading the book, I think mm -hmm. um, I think you did a really wonderful job of that, and I, I think people will really relate to it. Thank you. And the, the scenes with, with Sweetie and her mom are painful and hard to read, but right. the scene of that journey between them is really powerful. Yeah, it's really cool because um, I've gotten a lot of email from high school, um, like bloggers and stuff who got an advanced copy. And it's really cool how deeply teen readers will read. Um, and it's just, it blows me away every time, like the in-depth analysis. <laughs> Uh, in this, in these emails, and it's just like people really dig deep to see like this really touched me, and um, I've had a couple of people recreate the cover because they felt so seen by it, and it was just amazing. So yeah, I, I hope you're right. I hope people can see themselves. The other thread that I really loved was the hero Ashish. Mm -hmm. Ashish, yeah. Ashish, um, who you, a lot of you probably remember. He read the first one. Um, Something that you, you did a wonderful job of, I think, is showing him become more appreciative of his culture through Sweetie mm -hmm. because of their, I don't want to be spoilery, but their events, mm -hmm. their days that they do together. Um, right. You see his his arc, too, as he grows and thinking something is dumb or boring and, and actually ending up being moved emotionally or having fun or just opening him up. Um, and I was curious, as a writer, if you knew when you started out was that a thread you wanted to do with him or did that kind of evolve as you started telling the story? It was one of those things that um, Ashish was, I always knew that, that that would be in there, but it was one of those things that had to be massaged and brought out more as the editing process went along. So like I started out with this arc of, you know, he'd been dumped by his the only girl he'd ever loved. And so he starts out the book in like this state where he's lost all his mojo and he's like i'm not a you know there's a line where he says i'm not the gq model i thought i was i'm a freaking teletubby <laughs> and that's like i thought that was gonna be his arc of like it's okay to be a teletubby ashish you know <laughs> they're fun too <laughs> but then um as i went through the book as i finished writing it my editor was like i feel like there's this other arc for him that's also to do with tradition and family and kind of embracing parts of himself that he hadn't before. And so maybe we can bring that out more. And that's, so in like subsequent drafts, that's kind of what I started pulling out more of. Um, I, and that ended up being a really good um, arc for him because he and Rishi have this kind of relationship too, where he feels like Rishi's the golden boy that his parents love way more than they love him. And, you know, he kind of, comes to terms with all of that as well. And I felt like that is what makes characters really rich and three-dimensional is if they don't just have one thing that they're working on, but there are many facets to their personality, kind of like 
us, you know, like walking around. There's not just one thing we're working on at any point. So yeah, that was really a fun thing to discover about him. Yeah, I really, I love that. Gave him a whole other level. Yeah, thanks. It was really fun. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about tropes. Okay. Um, I think um, writing romance, <clears throat> Uh, most romance readers and writers, obviously, are familiar with a lot of tropes that are really common. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one th that you've done with these, both of these books, which is really cool, is taking a, a trope that I'd say is used mostly in historical adult novels, usually with white characters, is the arranged marriage. And, <laughs> right. and you had fun with, hey, let's try this for YA. Right. Um, which is, it, it's just so cool. and. Can you talk? I'd like to hear about, um, first of all, I guess you decided to do that, and also read a response to that. And if everyone that wants an arranged date, <laughs> I'm, I'm launching a new dating service app. <laughs> arrange all your dates. No, um, it was really fun with Dimple because like, I felt like um, that hadn't been done before in YA where it was like an arranged marriage trope, but it, obviously nobody got married because it's YA. But also that it wasn't like creepy or, you know, it wasn't like a creepy old dude with like a super young girl or something. And I kind of modernized, I tried to modernize it. And so with Ashish's story, I he would never agree to something like that, but I wanted it to be where his parents were acting really smug about like Dimple and Rishi and what a success they were. And so Ashish was like, fine, then if you think you can do so great, then you know, set me up with a girl. And so they do, but they make him sign a contract because they know he's going to try to squirrel oh, no. his, his way out of it. <laughs> and they say he has to go on four contracted dates. And because they're the Patels, they say he has to go to like the temple with this girl. And he's like, really? Are you serious? That's where I'm supposed to take this girl out on a date, the temple. And they do like four other dates like that. And um, I thought it would be fun to go the other way with Ashish, who is so different than Rishi. If you guys remember Rishi, he's very traditional, very soft, very like, you know, accepting of his parents and stuff. And Ashish is the complete opposite. So I wanted to put him to the test and kind of see like, what would a character do if he's so westernized, he never dates Indian American girls. Um, and now he's forced to, and he's kind of put himself in this position, so he can't back out, you know, because it's like an ego thing. <laughs> so, like, what would happen? Like, what are the hijinks that could come out of that, right? So it's kind of a twist on the arranged marriage trope, yeah. I guess.